Good afternoon, good evening, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Miriam Nyhan Gray, and we're delighted to welcome you back to our Black, Brown and Green Voices series. Uh, this is coming to you uh, from the African-American Irish Diaspora Network, but we're really delighted to partner with Luxman Ireland House at New York University and the John Braidmas Centre of New York University, as well as our wonderful friends at New York Public Library's Schomburg Centre for Research in Black Culture. Uh, we're here today to talk to Dr. Laura Cassidy by way of Trinity College Dublin uh, about uh, some of the fascinating work that she's been doing over the last number of years. Um, we do have ourselves set up in a Zoom webinar format. We can see that there are some of you out there, um, but we uh, will we'll, you'll just be able to see uh, the three of us or the two of us at times during the session. We will open up for questions towards the end of the conversation. If you'd like to uh, place them in the Q&A function or in the chat function, I'll do my best to moderate them and uh, hope that we can uh, continue the conversation a little bit with Lara. And I think that's it in terms of housekeeping. Um, but what I'll do now is hand over to my colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Kim uh, DaCosta. She's also affiliated with New York University and the African American Irish Diaspora Network. Uh, Kim, thank you for being here with us today and for doing the introductions. I hand over to you now. Well, my pleasure, Miriam. Um, to start, I would like to introduce Miriam um, and then Dr. Cassidy. Miriam Nyhan Gray, trained as a historian in Ireland, Italy, and the United States. Her interests lie in the spheres of migration, race, ethnicity, and diaspora nationalism. She's taught at NYU's Glucksman Ireland House since 2009 and is a director of NYU's Archives of Irish America's Glucksman Ireland House Oral History. A founding board member of the African American Irish Diaspora Network, Miriam initiated the Black, Brown and Green Voices Project in 2019 to amplify the stories and connections of peoples of African and Irish ancestry. She's a regular co-editor of the American Journal of Irish Studies and was the inaugural associate editor of the NYU Press Glucksman Irish Diaspora Series. And Dr. Lara Cassidy is an assistant professor of genetics at Trinity College Dublin. She holds a PhD in paleogenomics from TCD Smurfit Institute of Genetics, where she was an awardee of a postgraduate scholarship by the Irish Research Council. Her doctoral focus was the application of DNA sequencing technologies to the study of Irish prehistory, which resolved long-standing questions on the origins of the modern population. Her current research focus is the creation of a dense temporal data set of ancient Irish genomes. This is used, being used to study the evolutionary forces that have shaped human health and disease on the island, as well as to reconstruct pre prehistoric social structures and cultural practices through patterns of relatedness and inbreeding. And with that, I will turn it back over to Miriam to start the conversation. Thank you so much, Kim. Uh, great to have you here with us and thanks for doing those introductions. Um, so, uh, Laura, uh, again, thank you. Uh, wonderful to be here with uh, a bigger audience to chat to you today and really thrilled that we have the opportunity to become familiar with the work that you've been doing uh, in a great uh, place for the center, the study of uh, genetics and genomes, I guess we would say, uh, at Trinity College Dublin, uh, by way of our old friend, uh, D D uh, Dr. Dan Bradley, we were talking about Dan's uh, visit to our uh, New York uh, a number of years ago, and delighted to continue the connection with you there uh, in this conversation today. We associate Ireland with some of the lightest skinned peoples in the world. And I was looking at some really interesting conversations between yourself, actually, and Professor Bradley um, around some of those topics. Um, but your research makes some really interesting predictions 
uh, about our, I guess, prehistoric past. Now, Lara, you know that I'm a historian of the more modern period. To me, 100 years ago seems like a long time ago. Uh, and you're putting me and I think many of us watching today out of our chronological comfort zone uh, with your research. And we're really thrilled to have this opportunity. Could I trouble you in kind of baby steps language in as much as you can? And I hate asking you to distill down this research in this in that way. But can you give um, for me and for people watching today us a general overview of the genetic history of the population of what we refer to as Ireland today or how you kind of set the context of when and where you're studying uh, what you're studying? Sure. Yeah, it's hard to kind of recalibrate yourself, I suppose, to these longer uh, timescales. So um, actually, in sort of the global human story, Ireland um, has a very, very relatively like, recent human history. We've only had permanent occupation of the island for about 10,000 years. And if we look at the genetics of populations uh, living on the island um, across time, what really pops out at us, the, the, the sort of the major pattern is um, we have three very distinct, very genetically distinct groups living uh, on the island at different points in time. Um, our first group uh, relates to the uh, hunter-gatherer populations. Um, these are the first populations that permanently lived in Ireland uh, in the Mesolithic uh, period. Our second group then uh, are Ireland's first farmers. Um, so the first Stone Age farmers in the Neolithic uh, period who, are, who arrived on the island about 6,000 years ago. And they, and then we have that uh, seemingly uh, strong continuity in that population for about a millennia and a half. And then we have another big change and uh, sort of a new population on the island at the start of the Bronze Age 4,000 years ago. And from that point on, then we see relative continuity uh, in Ireland, uh, uh, genetically anyway, until the present day. That's uh, just a broad, broad uh, brushstroke kind of picture of it. If you get into the nitty gritty of it, it's more complicated, but. So, um, so, so that's great to, for, for us to kind of have that sense of when we're talking about uh, Lara. Um, you, um, you mentioned, I see sometimes you use the word I, Irelanders in your research um, in a way that I would kind of instinctively use the term Irish. Uh, is, there, is that just language or my inaccuracy or clumsy use of language? Or is there something meaningful in terms of that term Irelander and what you mean by it? I was just interested in that. Yeah, um, I, yeah I always think of the different groups of Irelanders. I suppose uh, the word Irish is something in the modern day anyway that means so many things and has so many different meanings and multifaceted meanings to different people. And it's uh, you know the Irish nationality, Irish ethnicity, um, Irish identity. So I think because we're dealing with such longer time scales and so many different people have called Ireland home at different points in time and we have these populations that are radically different in terms of their uh, culture, linguistically, uh, their ancestry, their genetics, that it just kind of, uh, I suppose, made more sense. Uh, <laughs> Um, I also like the word. It just has a nice ring to it, Ireland. Yeah, no, no, I, think, I agree. I actually think where I first read that was uh, a book, a really great book uh, I read at the very start of my PhD, which some of you might have read, called The Origins of the Irish by Jim Mallory. Uh, JP Mallory, he's an uh, expert on Indo European studies, but uh, he wrote a very good. This was. Uh, pre the ancient genetic uh, revolution though, that he wrote that book. So um, he's probably writing an update maybe now. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot to unmute there. Um, so one of the terms that features in your work, Lara, um, frequently is the term 
genome. And I apologize to anyone who's watching today who's saying, God, Miriam, everyone knows what a genome is. But would you, for the un uninitiated, because uh, I think it'll be helpful as our conversation kind of progresses, what are genomes? If you could kind of give us a sense of what th that what is meant by um, genomes and um, tell us a little bit about ancient genomes and why Ireland seems to be an interesting place to study um, these phenomena as we move into um, the genetic predictions of the hunter-gatherer populations. Um, that is actually the kind of part of your research that um, grabbed some attention in terms of the uh, New York and uh, Irish Times uh, piece uh, uh, in the last few months and, and, and a related t television documentary. If you could set that up for us, it would be great. Okay, so genomes, what are genomes? So uh, uh, on a basic level, a genome, I suppose, it can be thought of like almost as an instruction manual uh, that has all the instructions to sort of create and maintain uh, your body. Uh, they're written in the language of DNA, uh, our four chemical uh, uh, letters, A, C, G, and T. And almost every cell in your body is gonna have two copies of the human genome, one inherited from your mother and one inherited uh, from your father, All right? And uh, in our cells, uh, our genomes are packaged up really tightly into what we call chromosomes, uh, which are, um, you know, uh, tens of millions of these letters long, all like tightly, tightly packaged up into your cell. Uh, when we die, uh, when somebody dies and their, you know, um, uh, their cell structures break down and the DNA also breaks down and becomes uh, shredded up into many, many tiny, tiny, tiny fragments. Um, and they can be deposited in the, uh, in the bone matrix, basically. Um, and that's our ancient DNA. So we can then come along uh, thousands of years later uh, and look at archaeological human remains. And we can um, take, uh, we usually target particular parts of the skeleton that tend to have uh, better preservation of the ancient DNA. One of those, uh, one of those um, elements is called the petrous temporal bone. Uh, it's a uh, bone surrounding sort of your, uh, your inner ear. Uh, apparatus and it's uh, super super dense. If you cut this, and we typically cut it with the um, this sort of diamond edge saw, but if you cut it, it sometimes the inside of it, it almost looks like marble. It's so shiny. So excellent preserver um, of of the DNA. So we usually powderize up um, a portion of the petrus and then put it in solution, different buffers to extract the ancient DNA from it. And I'm giving you the whole story now. <laughs> so then we, uh, then we, um, uh, what we then basically have is uh, millions of billions of tiny little ancient DNA molecules flo floating around in solution. And what we do is we prep them and uh, we send them off for DNA sequencing. And there was this huge uh, technological revolution in DNA sequencing in probably the mid to late 2000s where um, these different platforms were developed that could sequence millions of millions of DNA molecules simultaneously, like in parallel or, or at the same time. So whereas before the technology was better suited for sequencing one molecule at a time, suddenly you could get 100 million in parallel. And that was so important for um, ancient DNA, where in a bone, you might be dealing with the fact that most of the DNA you're sequencing is bacterial and all the fragments are super tiny. So we can now go take a bone, sequence much of the DNA that's in it. And then on our computer, we get back all of these tiny little sequences, maybe 60 to hundred letters long. And then it's sort of like doing a jigsaw where you basically piece it all back up together again to reconstruct the full genome of that ancient person. And then we call that um, an ancient genome creatively. <laughs> so, um, no, that's fascinating, uh, Laura. I, I, I appreciate your, and I'm sure some of, at least some of our people watching will appreciate your, your kind of giving us the detail of that. So um, then to the, the other kind of part of that question, 
Um, what can you tell us about where Ireland lies geographically and, you know, the kind of um, archaeological or geological space that we have ha inhabited that makes it particularly either interesting or uninteresting when it comes to the study of genomes? Um, okay, yeah, so, well, I think Ireland is interesting for lots of different um, reasons. Uh, it's obviously on the northwest extreme uh, of Europe, it's the continental edge. And for big kind of cultural revolutions um, that swept the continent at different points in time, things like agriculture, uh, Ireland is sort of like uh, the, the final kind of destination uh, in a way. Um, Ireland also like um, um, a lot of places at Northern Latitudes is good for ancient DNA studies because it is uh, not the best weather here, as I'm sure a lot of you uh, know, but it's, um, you know, temperate and it's cloudy, not too much UV um, and heat and UV are very bad for uh, uh, DNA survival. So colder climates uh, are, are much better in that way. Um, Ireland is also a fantastic place to do this work because Ireland has an amazing archaeological uh, community. Um, a lot of great research going on here. And also uh, one thing is, with, um, especially with the Celtic tiger and the building of lots of motorways and things like that, um, a huge amount of um, commercial archaeology was done along the different route ways and a lot of discoveries have been made um, quite recently. And uh, yeah, that, so that's, uh, it all kind of combines together to make it a very good place to sample from. And, and, and to what extent, um, Laura, is, um, well, and I don't know exactly when Ireland got cut off in the kind of rudimentary way that I know, but say uh, as an island or whenever, yeah. that kind of stuff, how, how important is that? So yeah, Ireland has a bit of a different history here compared to the neighboring islands of Britain. So where I suppose to start with during the last glacial maximum, Ireland was deep beneath the glacier, right? So uh, uh, except potentially for places in the, in the Southwest. So um, while it was connected to the continent at that time, it's sort of under ice. Um, and anybody kind of coming into Ireland um, during that very cold period would have probably been kind of nomadic hunter groups, maybe following reindeer or things like that. They weren't going to stay too long. Um, then we come into the Holocene, right? The earth warms and the ice sheets retreat uh, from Europe. But Ireland emerges uh, very quickly, basically, as an island and gets cut off um, from Britain. Um, some estimates of sea level modeling put it about 14,000 years ago that Ireland became an island. Well, Britain, on the other hand, uh, Britain stayed attached to the continent uh, through uh, an area of land called the Doggerland, or the Doggerland Bridge. And uh, Britain remained attached until I think about 8,000 years ago. So Ireland has been an island for almost twice um, as long. So uh, in terms of sort of uh, larger uh, human history in Europe here, um, after the ice sheets retreat, um, we see population expansion back into the north of European hunter-gatherer groups. And uh, there's one specific type of ancestry we see that's associated with sort of uh, Italy, and uh, maybe the southeast, and that expands back up north and west. And these groups, these related groups, um, they get reach Spain, they reach France, they reach Britain, and eventually they reach Ireland. And what then seems to happen uh, in Ireland, the we have sampled hunter-gatherer genomes from Ireland from maybe four thousand years after the island was uh, originally settled by these groups. And their genomes have in them signals of uh, prolonged isolation. And so um, they seem basically, well, if we compare it to British hunter-gatherer genomes, there seems to have been more contact and gene flow between Britain and the continent. Um, the Irish 
uh, seem isolated. They seem to be sort of their own lineage that has had less impact from, from continent, continental sources. So it seems that um, potentially uh, the Irish hunter-gatherer population underwent prolonged periods of isolation after colonization of the island. And uh, especially on the eve of agriculture in the island, we, we don't see much evidence of contact um, with the wider sort of Atlantic world. Uh, there might be, but lack of seeing genomic contact or genetic contact doesn't mean zero contact with other groups, just not enough to kind of wipe away that, um, that signal of isolation. So that then, and then we get agriculture and there was a really, you know, a big debate for a long time with agriculture. If you see agriculture uh, appear in any region of the world in the archaeological record, the big question was always, is this movement of people or movement of ideas or both and how much people versus how much ideas, all of that. For Ireland and Britain, um, the genetic data has come down firmly on this was a major movement of people into the islands over a relatively short uh, time span. And these I'm sorry, I'm going on to do, I'm going to go right down to the No, end, no, 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 no. <laughs> this, this is fascinating, Laura. No, no, keep going, keep going. This is great. So our, I suppose we have our first farmers. Yeah, they come in. And the first farming populations in Britain and Ireland are very culturally similar, uh, likely coming from a similar source uh, in uh, France. And they're bringing in cereals, they're bringing in cattle and sheep and goats, sort of new big rectangular housing structures. And they also bring with them uh, uh, new funerary rituals uh, and particularly megalithic tombs and these big stone uh, burial chambers that uh, the Atlantic seaboard for right down to Portugal and up into Scandinavia are very famous for these monuments during the period. And uh, we've sampled, we've sampled genomes from a lot of these megalithic uh, burials and megaliths are also really great for ancient DNA because uh, they kind of act like caves so they have kind of, uh, they're cool and uh, not massive fluctuations in the temperature which is again great for the old DNA preservation. So when we sample individuals from megaliths throughout the period, um, what we find is that their ancestry uh, about 80% of it derives from agricultural populations who lived in uh, Turkey, the region of modern day Turkey, thousands of years beforehand. So this is uh, uh, Anatolia, Turkey in the Fertile Crescent of uh, the Middle East. This is one of the cradles of agriculture. And the bigger pattern that's emerged um, from research from lots of labs is agriculture coming into Europe was also driven by movement of people. And that movement reached eventually over uh, a millennia or two millennia, two and a half millennia almost, uh, it reached all the way to Ireland. As these people moved through Europe, uh, they picked up uh, uh, ancestry, they, they mixed and, and, and married, I suppose, uh, people from uh, the sort of indigenous hunter-gatherer groups of Europe. So by the time they reach Ireland, about 20% of their ancestry is coming from European hunter-gatherer populations. And France and Brittany and that, that whole uh, northern zone was a real kind of hot spot of interaction between the two groups. But the thing we were really interested in is, is what happened to the Irish hunter-gatherer population when these uh, newcomers arrive and they set up. Uh, seemingly in, in big numbers, because we don't have any evidence of inbreeding bottlenecks in the very earliest farming communities in Ireland. So they're well connected um, and definitely good seafarers. So we looked and we couldn't find really any evidence of a Irish hunter-gatherer specific contribution to the wider population at large. But we did find um, one individual one male individual, and he was uh, interred in a tomb in the southwest of Ireland in County Clare in the limestone Burren region, um, 
limestone also very good uh, for the preservation of ancient DNA. And his genome, uh, basically, he did show a component of Irish hunter-gatherer ancestry. Uh, and um, he was an outlier in that respect. And we could estimate that he had uh, an ancestor of fully Irish hunter-gatherer an uh, ancestry, probably about uh, four or so generations back in his family tree. And that was really cool because that was sort of like a snapshot that's catching an interaction between the two groups through their uh, descendant, right? So we know at some point an interaction um, occurred. Um, and yeah, that's nice because as I said, in the bigger picture, we don't see that. And that's potentially just a numbers game in terms of if you have that many people coming in, the entire Irish hunter-gatherer population might not have numbered more than 10,000 people. They might have been completely assimilated in, but if you get continuous migration in, um, that contribution could have just been diluted beyond detection. And that's why I suppose ancient DNA is really nice because we don't just look at the sort of impact on descendant populations, we also can get snapshots of demographic events in real time when they're happening too. So, that, so that, that's sort of uh, our story there. Um, so, um, Lara, I want to push you, though, just because um, oh. this is what, uh, not push you, but just to go back to something. Um, so it's the hunter-gatherer population um, that kind of caught my eye in terms of talking to you about this and uh, caught the eyes of, of others. Um, mm -hmm. Tell us, if I'm not mistaken, what your genetic predictions imply for that hunter-gatherer population of Ireland and I guess I, I I can't remember if you told me this before about how or actually maybe you just touched on that how how that relates the Irish population uh, to the rest of Europe but maybe you just said that we're actually yeah. all part and I'm, I'm talking about so phenotypically that they had dark skin and blue yeah. eyes, if you can talk about that. So, yeah, so um, skin pigmentation is an interesting one in Europe because it's been under selection. Uh, it's been under natural selection in European populations and not just European populations, Asian populations to it, northern latitudes. Um, uh, as was response to vitamin D deficiency and a lack of UVB radiation, which uh, we need to synthesize um, vitamin D in our skin. So there was a question then um, about when and the timing of, of when we started to see lighter skin uh, pigmentation in Europeans. And this is something that was, we were able to explore with ancient DNA. So these European hunter-gatherers uh, in the west of Europe, um, the first genomes from these people, uh, they, there's two, there's two mutations, there's two variants uh, in Europe today that are responsible uh, majorly for, for lighter skin pigmentation we see in these populations. And the Western hunter-gatherers had neither of them. Um, so that gives us a prediction of quite dark skin uh, for these people. And when we sequenced the Irish hunter-gatherers, we saw the same, and um, they don't have these mutations involved in lighter skin. Um, so yeah, we would predict um, a dark skin profile for them. Um, but the interesting thing is, and now these are predictions, um, but the they've seen, and we saw in the Irish in, in these Western hunter gatherer populations, um, a sort of a set of mutations that's uh, strongly associated with blue eye color uh, in, in modern day populations. So that, um, um, that led on, some of you probably have seen sort of uh, headline stories about that, of that sort of kind of striking prediction of this profile of, of quite dark skin and then the, the lighter, um, possibly blue kind of eye color. Uh, so that's, uh, I, I suppose, and it's, it's a nice one to find out because as well, like it's something people might have suspected that lighter skin in Europe um, uh, and the selection for it has been a relatively more recent thing. Uh, but it's nice because sometimes I think when we do reconstructions of prehistory or artistic impressions of prehistory in Europe, uh, everybody's white just because we've assumed that's the that's the default. So uh, yeah, I suppose it challenges you in that way to kind of rethink 
um, what populations might have looked like. And it's a, it's a wonderful thing because there's uh, to be able to do with ancient DNAs to be able to predict past uh, phenotype because we obviously can't get that from the archaeological record. And then um, with our early farmer population um, who come in, they bring with them one of the mutations that's associated with lighter skin in Europeans today. And that's nearly at 100% frequency uh, in Europe today. Um, but they don't really carry the other mutation in that, uh, uh, in, at that high frequency. So the prediction there is, um, I suppose, sort of maybe what you would expect from populations in Mediterranean Europe or, uh, or Turkey or somewhere uh, today. We only see like pale skin, like pale, like or pale skin predictions. Um, the kind of, I suppose, the stereotypical notion people have of Irish skin today. Um, that variant, um, it, that's sort of a Bronze Age establishment. And actually, even then, we see it climb through time. So even if you go back to the Iron Age, it's still not, it's, it's at lower frequency than it is today. So that's sort of a classic signal of, of natural selection is a, is a variant increasing and increasing quite steadily through time in this non-random way. And then there's a really big question uh, there about why, why this strong selection for um, lighter skin and why only maybe more recently. And there's lots of different kind of, hypotheses knocking around. One of the big clear ones is that this correlates with northern latitudes. Uh, people at northern latitudes tend to have lighter skin, something to do with UV radiation or uh, exposure to UV and vitamin D deficiency, because if you have more melanin, uh, you synthesize less uh, vitamin D or you let more UV radiation in. And if you lack vitamin D, that can uh, cause all sorts of problems. Um, vitamin D is very important for calcium homeostasis in our bodies. So diseases of vitamin D deficiency uh, tend to impact the skeleton, things like rickets in children or like softening of the bone. But another interesting thing is, um, and there's been a few papers on this uh, during the pandemic, uh, vitamin D deficiency can be associated with worse outcomes uh, for some respiratory and infectious diseases, including COVID. And also there's some evidence with TB. So potentially if you're a population that's being hit by um, various epidemics again and again, to be vitamin D deficient uh, might not have been a very good thing. And that's where the selection pressure could have um, come from. It's also interesting because Ireland has one of the highest frequencies of lactase persistence as well. So this ability to drink milk into adulthood uh, reaches, I think, potentially a global peak in frequency uh, in Ireland today. And um, that uh, ability to drink milk into adulthood, again, could be useful for lots of different reasons in a, in a famine time, if there's water, you know, water sources are contaminated, lots of different reasons why it might be useful to be able to drink milk without getting sick. But uh, lactase or, or lactose, sorry, also encourages calcium absorption in the gut as well. So it might just have been that just up in the northwest edge of Europe in a very cloudy place that both these and we things adapted to it. Yeah, that's yeah. fascinating. The 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 other part of that interaction, the the phenotype end of it in terms of us, as you say, and you know, you know, we do this all the time in terms of modern day depictions of historic events, not just in Ireland, where we're imposing kind of European norms of like phenotype and stuff like that. But um, is am I correct in thinking, Laura, that in in the interactions between the hunter gatherers who were in Ireland and the first farmers like that migration of people um you don't know have a sense though of how that worked on the ground in terms of whether it was violent whether it was you know kind of you know an easy integration are are, are there ways that genetically or maybe archaeologically you can get a sense of what that big migration that you know 
I think Im impactful cultural mm. I uh, event had on uh, on the existing population and vice versa. Um, I, no, uh, so um, what the interactions were like, whether they differed at different points of time or in different regions of the island, uh, that's beyond us with the genetics. I mean, we can say that there was interaction and I suppose we're saying this is one example of somebody with a hunter-gatherer ancestor who was buried in a megalith. And he had this, um, this man had a third degree relative buried in the same tomb as well. So he's clearly a member of this uh of this society and uh having a hunter gather ancestor i suppose didn't exclude him from megalithic burial or neolithic burial customs but beyond that it's impossible to say and i, I think i said that already it's just the numbers game if the irish hunter gatherer population was very very low densities um no matter what the interaction was like no matter if it was very violent or very you know uh or if there was a lot of integration, like one of the things we can, uh, and one of the problems I suppose is there's so few uh, human remains from the Mesolithic, from the hunter-gatherer population. Um, and then when we get to the Neolithic, all of our remains really are coming from megalithic tombs. So the burial kind of structures of the incomers, whether that could be invisible hunter-gatherer populations or populations of majority Irish and together ancestry still living on the island, but burying their dead potentially in more invisible ways. So then we're not finding them, we can't sample them. And but so maybe it's archaeological discovery. <laughs> uh, we need their and, and, and even at that, Laura, to your point, it's um how much can you extrapolate from the few instances that potentially even archaeologically you might find to be, mm -hmm. allow you to say, you know, right, I, I guess with in the same way as we do with um, in the modern period with our sources, how much, how, how, how widely can you kind of basically extrapolate those kind of conclusions or hypotheses mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, beyond, you know, to your like, it, you know, uh, remains that indicates trauma, maybe just a once off uh, um, as or mm -hmm. or, cha at, or as you rightly do remind us of how it may have been different over time, because we're mm -hmm. talking about long periods and it may have been different from region to region, even within yeah. Ireland. I should say, actually, one of the tombs we sampled from in the burn, uh, Pulna Brown does have evidence of traumatic injury on some of the skeletons. So you can get evidence of violence, obviously from the archeological um, record, but we don't know who was fighting who. <laughs> so it could be that different incoming farming groups were competing with each other uh, more so. So that, that's, uh, but yeah, we'll see. We'll see what comes out of it over the next, I don't know, 10 or, 10 or so years and see what else. Uh, yeah, and Laura, that's something, you know, you've mentioned the burn and you've mentioned a few t times, I think we're all getting a really good um, overview of the perfect conditions to preserve uh, um, genetic um, <laughs> DNA for you to sample. But the, the burn, if I can just ask you a little bit about that, the burn uh, in Clare is a very, is a, is, is a pretty special place in terms of what it allows can you talk a little bit just about the burn in terms of your work yeah so the well the burn is fantastic um and we've had fantastic collaborators uh archaeological collaborators who work on the burn uh, people like uh, Carlton Jones and Anne Lynch and uh, have excavated these tombs like Pulna Brown uh which some of you might know um it's this amazing portal dolmen uh, that if you're in Dublin airport there's a big picture of it because it's just so uh uh, so beautiful but yeah the burn is like that it's just this excellent preserver of the past because of this limestone um, landscape um, many many of these tombs survive I think it's like one of the densest sort of uh, uh, landscapes of megalithic tombs in the world and, and more than that like the history is so layered in the burn and I, I think that's in the documentary you can stand somewhere and you can be looking at megalithic tombs you can be looking at uh wedge tombs actually which are from the copper and bronze age you can be looking at uh, medieval churches you can be looking at you know 
Iron Age bridge systems. Oh, you've got it up <laughs> for Iron, Iron Age. Uh, that that's Paul Nebron, right? That is Paul Nebron. Yes. Just for people to visualize. Um, it's a be- it's a, it's a beautiful place. But, but and what's incredible about those tombs as well is like there's depositions. So Paul Nebron was one of the is one of the earliest structures. Um, built uh, in the Neolithic world that we know of, sorry, that's one of the earliest surviving ones. So the individuals we see comes from Pulna Brown. Most of them are like the, the some of the earliest Neolithic individuals on the island, but then there's also individuals interred there from, from the Bronze Age. So that tomb has actually been used for burial for uh, two, two millennia on and off the main phase of activity being in the Neolithic, but it was used again by later groups. So this is clearly a, a, a really important special place and a marker in the landscape um, for many, many, many millennia. Uh, it's incredible to think about it, that it was ancient. It was ancient 4,000 years ago and people were seeing it as this ancient thing of the past uh, thousands of years before, before we came along. So it's... Wow. So uh, anyone who's who hasn't been to the burn, it's um, it's well worth a visit for many reasons. But uh, at Lara's research uh, and, and, to- and, and chat today is uncovering even more interesting facts about it. Um, can I ask you, Lara, like when um, the some of the conversation we've had uh, came about because of a, a wonderful documentary, if anyone's tuning in from Ireland I believe it's still available on RT player uh, it may be called the burn or if you just this, put the it. secret the secrets uh, of the burn by Katrina Costello was the filmmaker I, there right. yeah. thanks Laura it's well worth watching I'm not sure that it's actually available at the moment from the US um, but part of uh, the kind of promotion around that documentary and um, the, as I mentioned the Irish Times piece picked up um, this interesting um, fact about phenotype in terms of the prehistoric hunter-gatherers being potentially predicted as dark-skinned and blue-eyed. How for you as a researcher, um, Lara, and you're kind of embedded in this work all the time, and you're, you know, working in such a distant past, how comfortable or uncomfortable is it for you to kind of um, engage with, or or how, you know, how, I guess more generally, how we, it makes so your work in part is not a unique example, but a good example of how modern the categorizations or um, kind of uh, traits that we ascribe to groups are and how there are so many different things going on in terms of climate, natural selection, all these different things that you've described Mm -hmm. so well. How do you reflect on that kind of you know, you living in the present and what your your research tells us about the past and how we kind of how we how we I guess translate or distill that down into into today. Yeah. So yeah, I think there. Well, the main thing is the past is a completely different country. That's a phrase that's used um, an awful lot. And uh, we're talking about. I think for people's identity, the past can be very important and important for valid reasons. But I think sometimes people want to send, feel like there's a sense of permanence in the past or there's, there's an anchoring there. Well, if you actually study <laughs> the past, especially the deep past, I think people especially feel like the deep past, maybe because it's more mysterious, a bit of a black box, we can then put in all of our kind of origin myths uh, in there. But uh, what the, the main sort of thing is that nothing is permanent unfortunately genetic populations not permanent languages culture always changing ephemeral things and I do think especially with ancestry maybe again it's something people feel like is a more of a fixed thing (laughs) but human populations are always moving they're splitting they're diverging they're meeting they're mixing they're splitting again um always always in flux and Ireland even though it's at a continental edge in an island so you, you would expect maybe a bit more isolated than some regions uh it's the same thing uh we're always having movement to uh, and from the island and 
Uh, yeah, I suppose then to, it was important uh, in the modern period to build up a sort of a Irish national identity, a Gaelic identity, because um, for, for political reasons at the time. And people obviously draw on the past to build that. That's a normal thing to do. But sometimes, yeah, it's important to realize that the past that they're building on is, is much more complicated than sometimes it can be simplified uh, down into. Um, I think, especially then when you go into the past, we circling back around to the word Irelanders, like, I mean, I, I think the word Irish, <laughs> when you study Ireland and deep history, modern day meanings of what Irish is obviously can't hold, uh, hold, hold water going back. So, but I think it's, it's quite a nice, I mean, like, I think as long as people realize they make their own identities and we sort of collectively agree what words mean and what being Irish means. And that is a thing that changes through the generations as well. That's, um, no. Yeah, and and Laura, you know, one of the things that you, when we chatted before um, about this topic, um, if if you wouldn't mind, because I think it's really uh, would be of interest to people uh, on with us today, um, how I th I think you said that how ancestry and geography are often kind of like put together. Is that is that am I remembering you correctly? That kind of that we that we, we fix them too much at times. Can you talk a little bit about, about that? Because I think it's it's rather instructive for what we're thinking about. Yeah, so uh, geography is a major driver of patterns of genetic variation, right? Um, so we can predict uh, sort of the geographic locations somebody's ancestors came from uh, based on, on, on their genome sequence. I think though sometimes people kind of forget that sort of that's not a deterministic uh sort of label it's an associative one so you might talk about Irish ancestry or you do a 23 and me test and it's like you're 95 percent uh Irish <laughs> um but that's basically I suppose that's almost what it's telling is you that like a lot of your distant cousins and relatives or ancestors going some way back uh lived in and around Ireland but that can fall apart uh, when you go back <laughs> a lot longer term, because like I was saying, like the association of uh, particular populations with particular geographic regions changes with migration and movement and population turnovers and stuff. Um, one thing also that's a very important thing, I suppose, to, to kind of realize is that like when we think of ancestry, uh, in terms of our own kind of families and stuff, we're sort of thinking five, six generations back in our family tree, maybe if you're a really good gene genealogist going back <laughs> 10 generations or something. But like when we go back to like, I go back a millennia or so, um, and I think you have something like a million genealogical ancestors, it increases uh, exponentially. And going back further, that increases and, um, on the other hand, your genetic ancestors are just a small fraction of those genealogical ones. And a lot of those genealogical ones are your ancestors multiple times over in many different ways. So it's such a tangled uh, mess going back. But like, say if you follow like Irish ancestry back or like what we consider Irish genetic ancestry back, like 5,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago, a lot of that ancestry would actually be in regions actually in, in and around the Black Sea in the steppe in modern day uh, Ukraine, um, actually is some of the populations, these steppe pastoralist populations. And we have big migrations into Europe in, at the end of the Neolithic start of the Bronze Age carrying this type of steppe ancestry. And you go back further still, I suppose you're gonna find out that all of our ancestors uh, are from Africa because that is the homeland uh, of humans. So that, I suppose that's what we were talking about, that association of genetic ancestry with a specific geographic location um, isn't, isn't neat and it especially breaks down um, the further back in time you go. I think there's an amazing bit of maths as well. Uh, 
that say if you pick any two people anywhere in the world, um, they probably share a genealogical ancestor within the past 3000 or so years or 2000, 3000 um, at most, just because of that sort of exponential growth of your genealogical ancestors. And if, if something like, I don't know, if you have like long distance migrants, we know coming into Britain during uh, and Ireland during the Roman period, say, if, if any of them kind of produced enough descendants to have an impact, it, it's very likely that they're uh, an ancestor of almost all people living in Britain today, genealogically, just because it, oh, we won't go there, but it's funny. And you go to like, uh, you go to archeological sites and stuff and it says, oh, our ancestors built this. And I think people just have this idea of this small group of people who are your, your ancestors. And these were us back two millennia ago. And really your ancestors two millennia ago are shared globally by so many people. Um, and there's, there's billions of them anyway, sorry, that's a whole... <laughs> no, it, it, it's really, you know, it's, it's really fascinating, Laura, because we spend a lot of time, you know, thinking about the nation state and, and, you know, the, you know, country identities tied to ethnicity and countries and things like that. And, you know, it's really, I think it's really, um, important to kind of push us back a little bit and on some of those assumptions I think years ago we used to say you know everyone in Ireland was their like 32nd cousin or something right so now your statistics are like putting us on a whole a whole new landscape and um, this is really interesting Laura before we're getting kind of close to time um we have a couple of questions here actually from um, Martin. Um, the first one is, do we find current inhabitants of Ireland displaying indications of all three historic genetic identities or is it the case that one group wi wiped out its predecessors? I think you kind of answered that, but do you just wanna? Yeah, so the thing is Europeans in general uh, show these different ancestries the hunt, European hunter-gatherer, early farmer, steppe pastoralist uh, in, in, in different amounts. And it's the exact same with the Irish uh, population. But the, the problem is, is that we, um, whether that early farmer ancestry came, came directly from the Irish early farmer population or if it was picked up en route to Ireland. So that the Neolithic to Bronze Age transition uh, that's looking like something like an 80%, 90% population replacement in Ireland, long term. Um, the actual dynamics of how that happened over the centuries aren't worked out. But so that's estimating about, a, I suppose, a 10% survival of the earlier farmer population. In terms of the Irish hunter gatherer population, nothing detectable. It's not detectable in the, the early farmer population. And then we have another big population turnover to deal with. But you do see European hunter-gatherer uh, ancestry, I suppose, uh, in European populations uh, as a whole, but not in Ireland from Irish hunter-gatherers. And uh, Martin asks as well, I understand that X and Y chromosomes are more persistent across multiple generations. Have you been able to isolate these chromosomes across each of the three DNA groupings? And if so, do we see these markers persisting into modern day populations? Yes, yeah, so Y chromosome haplotypes uh, passed down just for anybody who's not aware uh, from male to male, um, a son inherits his Y chromosome from his dad on and on. The mitochondrial DNA inherits through the female line. And uh, there's different Y and mitochondrial uh, haplogroups um, associated with different populations. So we do see, again, not Irish specific, but we see European hunter-gatherer mitochondrial lineages still uh, in Europe uh, today. In Ireland, we do see some persistence of early farmer Y chromosome haplogroups, but uh, mostly replaced by or 1b y chromosomes which some of you might know if you've yeah <laughs> so it, that's like the 95 percent of the irish male population today are or 1b which is this uh which is this haplotype that arrives in uh 
with the step migrations. Um, but there is some persistence, some minor persistence of Neolithic Y haplotypes that are associated with Britain and Ireland in the Neolithic. So that's sort of, yeah, you can kind of, um, but yeah, in terms of the Irish hunter-gatherer, no, not that we have seen. It's it's kind of, uh, it's poignant to think with the, the news in the last uh, 12 or so days to think that the uh, first farmers, given how impactful farming is on Irish uh, culture and society um, into the modern period that they may have originated around the period or the area of modern day Ukraine. I mean, to your point in terms of, you know, on the assumption that um, uh, there may be more, there are Ukrainians on the move, sadly, at the moment, but to your point in terms of the the non-static natures of populations at times, we can even see it in the very modern period and what that might mean over time in terms of mm -hmm. um, uh, the mixing of populations and everything. Laura, mm -hmm. thank you for, um, you know, I know it's not easy when you work in a field where um, you're, you're kind of trying to, you know, for me talking to the lowest common denominator in the room in terms of understanding and thank you for your patience and for sharing um, this really uh, rich and insightful research with us and you're still you're still working exactly on all we've discussed today right you're still working on this this stuff yeah. Yes, and thank you so much uh, for, for inviting me. Um, yes, we are basically, we're just trying to, uh, we're trying to build up a very dense data set and I suppose add more detail because you can talk about broad patterns, but yeah, we want to get into the kind of, the social uh, dynamics um, at these different transitions and uh, we're moving into the sort of Iron Age and early medieval period as well, which is maybe a little bit closer to, to modern history and looking at things like the impact of uh, Viking movement in and things like that. So loads, <laughs> lots to do. Yeah, and it, and, it, and it, I guess a, a kind of a, 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 a field that has been so uh, impacted by new technologies and everything. It must be rather exciting. Um, I hope, Laura, that we will have an opportunity to hear more from you because, you know, as, as I mentioned to you before, um, I, I guess the history of Ireland in terms of a place that people uh, ha has come to, we spend a lot of time, especially in the US, especially at NYU, for good reason, we think a lot about people leaving Ireland, but what it means in terms of people who came to Ireland in the deep past or more recently is always really interesting. Um, we have a, a comment here, wonderful presentation. Looking forward to hearing more about this fascinating project. Thank you, Bakari, for sharing that. And Laura, thanks for kicking off our Black, Brown and Green Voices series for spring 2022. Um, as I said, a real pleasure uh, to meet you virtually and um, keep us posted on your research and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. You too. Thank you so much. Thanks, Laura. Goodbye. See you. Bye bye.